Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to SOS Children's Villages webinar, Children in Emergencies. Uh, my name is Alison Wallace. I am Chief Executive of SOS Children's Villages here in the UK, and I'm delighted that you're able to join us this morning for this hour-long webinar. I'm particularly pleased to be joined by two of my international colleagues, Dr. Teresa Ngigi and Poppy Glivka. Uh, they lead much of SOS Children's Villages work with children in conflict and in emergency settings. Uh, Teresa, yeah. very, very nice to have you both joining us today. Uh, Teresa is a specialist in mental health in children, particularly children in conflict settings. In her work with SOS Children's Villages, she works both with children and with their carers to identify mental health issues and help children and their families work through crisis. In her three years with us, she's worked across countries as varied as Rwanda, Somalia, Lebanon and Syria, to name just a few. Poppy leads our refugee response work in Greece alongside colleagues at SOS Children's Villages in Greece and in particular is working with unaccompanied children in camps and ensuring that they have families and uh, families are made available through the, for them through the SOS Children's Villages programs in Greece. And I'm absolutely delighted that they could be with us here today. Now those two introductions barely cover, barely scrape the surface of what both Poppy and Teresa do with us. So please feel free to ask questions through the Q&A function as we go forward this morning. And we'll do our best to put as many of them to Poppy and Teresa as possible. Thank you. Teresa, can I start uh, this morning's webinar by turning to you and just saying, even by the standards of the last couple of years of immense kind of change and political upheaval, 2020 has been extraordinary and the impact of the global pandemic on children. Can you describe to us what you're beginning to see amongst the children and families that you work with in response to the COVID pandemic? Thank you very much, Alison. As, as we know, uh, SOS takes care of children who have lost parental care or are in the process of losing parental care. At the same time, works with children who are in, in the situation of emergency. And that already means that the children we are working with are already vulnerable. And that vulnerability is something that had started earlier on in their lives, so we receive them uh, when they have already been exposed to a lot of uh, adversity. And um, I'm actually going to answer your question, Alison, by telling you an experience of what has been happening around. I'll give you an experience of one of the children that is in our care. And uh, this child right now is about nine years old, and um, she, was, she, she was born by uh, teenage parents and uh, they neglected her and they were into drugs and they had a lot of, they, they did not have time for this child. So what happened was that uh, they could lock the child in the home and go away and leave the child uh, to stay there alone all day long. And then they would come in the evening and feed the child. So there was no bonding, there was no attachment and the child sometimes would just cry herself to sleep. And then when she was about one and a half, uh, the social services intervened and uh, the child was taken into SOS care. And so the, the child started bonding with the caregivers. I really, really admire our caregivers because they are so, so dedicated to what they do. So uh, this child was able to uh, be received in a very loving environment. She was able to be reaffirmed and the attachment process began. She started thriving, she started developing, and then uh, bang, COVID comes, and then her world is changed. And what happens? It means she can't go to school, she can't socialize with her, her friends, she cannot do the sports activities that she was used to, and so she started relieving the trauma that she experienced when she was 
one, two years old. Because when she could not leave the house, it was like lockdown for her. And that lockdown had already been lived long before. And so she started redressing. She started bed waiting. She started clinging on to the, the caregiver. She started also getting aggressive towards the other children. And people are like, what is this? What is happening? And then, of course, we realized that this child got re-traumatized because of what she, she had carried along into, into care. And then we had to work with, um, we had to work with um, the caregivers so that they could also be, know how to help and support this child. And gradually, they were able to reaffirm, encourage, and support this child so that she could start feeling safe again. Because, you know, her autonomic uh, nervous system was constantly on the alert because that is what trauma does to a child. And so being on the alert, anything that was dangerous rang familiar bells. And that is the reason why she regrets. But thankfully, our caregivers are trained. We invest a lot of time and effort to training the caregivers that take care of these children. And this child is now able to start going back to you know, uh, feeling safe, feeling um, confident. And so I can tell you that this is just one case out of so many, Alison, that, you know, many children are experiencing a lot of change in their, in their lifestyle with COVID. So it really sounds like COVID comes on top of all the other vulnerabilities that many of the children that we work with already have. And so it sounds like almost a disproportionate... Absolutely impact uh, uh, happens for Absolutely. them. Poppy, in your work in, in, in camps in Greece and working with unaccompanied children and refugee families, I mean, that, that's a particularly vulnerable situation in which those communities find themselves as well. How are you seeing the impact of COVID over these last few months? Well, actually, it's been a tough four years for us so COVID added an additional challenge. Uh, well, uh, families and children residing in camps in uh, really difficult situations have to endure uh, another challenge. They, they need to stay uh, healthy and at the, stay, and the same time they need to remain sane. As you can imagine, this is really difficult, especially uh, when they don't really know what is going to happen with their future, uh, what they have to deal with, um, and at the same time, how to support their children and provide for them. So yes, COVID unfortunately added an additional difficulty uh, to, to, to people that were already heavily traumatized by their journey and by fleeing uh, war and violence in our case. And, and we're seeing some photographs, I think, at the moment from some of the work that you do. Yes, in Greece. Actually, actually, well, I don't know if it is a good or a bad thing that I remember each and every photograph we are going to share today. This is a, a photo from uh, our kindergarten at Eleonas camp. Eleonas camp was, was and still is the biggest camp uh, near Athens uh, that started operating late 2015. Uh, the photo we are seeing at the moment is from uh, Moria and this one from uh, Karatepe, but if you'd like I can uh, uh, share a list of our activities just for our own dears to understand what we are doing. And we just passed through my favorite photo where children preschoolers were trying for the first time ever watermelon. It was really nice seeing them under the trees enjoy a slice of watermelon. So uh, we started working with the refugee population uh, back in 2016. Uh, during what we've learned to call refugee crisis uh, started. Uh, the situation started complete, uh, changed it completely since 2016, since we've passed from uh, people just crossing the country in order to reach the borders uh, to people stranded in camps. 
So we had in a matter of weeks to prepare teams to work in different camps all over the country and Lesbos Island in order to provide psychosocial support, recreational activities, uh, Greek, English, Arabic courses, sports activities and social services. Uh, what we see at the moment is where people have to stay even now uh, when they are leaving uh, the islands and uh, arriving in the mainland if, uh, in order to apply for asylum. Uh, as you can see, there is a difference between uh, pictures depicting the situation in camps and uh, what we do as SOS. Uh, through our programs, we really try to restore their childhood. We really try to provide a, a normal environment uh, where children can continue with their education, feel that they are children again, um, trust their caregivers and educators, and uh, start dreaming again for their future. It's extraordinary work which you and your colleagues uh, do in Greece. Uh, one, of the, one of the unique things which SOS Children's Villages does, of course, it is try to source uh, family and long-term support for children who, for whatever reason, have, have lost the care of, of their parents. Teresa, can you talk to us about how important that stability and consistency of family care, whether it's a child's own parents or, or, or other, other forms of care, is to a child's development? Absolutely. And, um, you know, building on what uh, Poppy shared, you know, uh, trauma has a huge impact on the development of a child. And of course, especially the brain. What it does is actually changes uh, the epigenetic expression on how we respond to stress. Mm -hmm. And this can lead to what we call dysregulation. And if we are not careful, uh, we get stuck in a sympathetic fight and flight mode, such that even when um, we, there is no danger, our system is scanning danger all the time because that is what it is used to, because a child is stuck there. And so it becomes very difficult to develop in other areas. Learning becomes difficult, bonding becomes difficult, development becomes difficult. And so that is why it's very important for us to be able to understand the impact of trauma on the developing brain. And I actually compare this with the three little pigs. You know, if the system of the child is built in brick, the big bad wolf is not going to destroy it. But if the system, that is the autonomic nervous system of the child is built on straw, then if things come, the child is going to be swayed here and there. And, and, and chances are that the child is going to collapse. The child is going to end up having a lot of physical, mental, social difficulties. And so um, our aim as SOS is to be able to avoid fanning these flames of trauma. That is why attachment for our caregivers is very, very important. Since these children were not able to attach to a good and healthy primary caregiver, because the fact that they are with us means that they could not, they, could, they were abandoned in some way, whether it was justified or not, it means that they were abandoned. So the, the bond was broken. And so our caregivers, need to be able to provide what I call the four S's to the child. The child needs to feel seen. The child needs to feel that the other person is uh, recognizing them, recognizing their presence. The child needs to feel safe. The adult has to serve as a buffer for the child in order for the child not to, to, to be too exposed to all these hardships uh, and relieving the traumas. The child needs to be soothed. They need to know that there is a place they can call home, that they can go back to, that the, the caregiver is going to soothe and encourage and comfort them. And the child needs to experience what we call secure attachment. 
that is security. So we encourage our caregivers to really develop these four S's in order for them to be able to bond and attach in a healthy way to the child so that now they can prepare them for the future. And how do we do that? You know, there is something we call uh, neuroplasticity. That means that our brain is able to be flexible enough to change and evolve and develop. We encourage children not to be stuck to their past they can change the way they live their life today, especially if they feel safe. So we encourage them to develop neuropl this neuroplasticity, to develop resilience through play. And now we shift from asking a child when they are having difficulties, what's wrong with you, into what happened to you. And that makes a big difference because the child doesn't feel blamed. The child doesn't feel accused. The child does, doesn't feel put in the corner. So SOS works, works, works very, very hard towards helping the children to be able to feel safe so that their fight and flight can now calm down and return to what we call communist games so that they can reclaim their power and so that they can feel that they have, they, they survived. They are not passive victims, but they are thriving survivors. Thank you. That's, a, that's an incredibly compelling analysis that you make there. How important is, is the role of the SOS mother or the SOS parents in that? Because you are only one, Teresa, unfortunately. We've, we've let to learn how to clone you. How much, how much time do you spend working with the parents and carers so that they can take forward that kind of approach to working with children? That is extremely important because if the carer is not healthy, the child is not going to be healthy. And I am a parent myself and I notice that every time I'm nervous, I project that to my children and start sometimes yelling at them for no reason. And then they look at me, they're like, where did that come from? Because when you are not healthy as a parent, the child cannot be healthy. So we invest a lot of time and efforts and resources to training and supporting co-care co-workers so that they can themselves deal with their own issues because all of them, of course, come with their issues. And even during this time of COVID, many of them were sort of stuck in SOS. They could not participate in their own family life. Some of them lost relatives. They could not even go for funerals and stuff like that. And so they are also dealing with their issues. Many times we talk about children and then we forget the caregivers. And the caregivers have a very, very important role to play. So we invest a lot of efforts. And um, what I usually do mainly is uh, in every country that I go, I organize trainings for co-care co-workers. We have um, different activities. We not only have the learning. We also have like even physical activities. We have mindfulness activities and we encourage them to also be able to find time for self-care. And then when they are strong, then they, they can be strong for the children. And the children rely on them. When they see them strong, they are like, yes, I know I, I, I am at home. And if my caregiver is strong, I'm also going to be strong. Thank you. Thank you. Which makes me want to, to ask you, Poppy, given those photographs you sh showed us and the fact that you've been working in that kind of environment uh, with SOS in Greece for, for five years and frankly, the, the refugee crisis, as you describe it, doesn't look like it will be solved soon. Um, and if anything, as winter approaches, work gets harder. How do you and your team uh, respond to that and, and keep, keep yourselves motivated and positive when it can feel sometimes like it's a, it's a problem which we ju just doesn't have, seem to have an end? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I couldn't agree more with what Teresa just said, that it is important for adults to reclaim their role in order to support children. And what uh, 
stress the team most when we are trying to be there for children is the fact that no viable solution is yet to be found. For us, this is the most challenging thing we have to, to deal with. Um, in addition, we work in really difficult situation, uh, but the most important thing is to build this uh, relationship based on trust uh, because children need to, to feel safe and their parents and caregivers need to feel empowered and in a condition to, to, to continue with their work. Uh, we invest a lot of time and resources to keep them safe, uh, to keep them ready, otherwise we wouldn't continue. And this is why we insist on a family-like protection scheme for all children, either unaccompanied or local. Uh, these children need all the all opportunities available for integration. These children need a healthy environment to, to, to create peer-to-peer -peer bonds and uh, their caregivers need to stay strong in order to continue providing quality services. Thank you, thank you. And that is, um, if I can intervene on the part of our supporters and donors at the moment, that's why uh, their support and their long-term support is so important, of course, for, for exactly those reasons that you describe, Poppy. Uh, we've got a question from, from one of our uh, participants. Um, this, this question circles back to COVID and the impact of COVID um, on the children and families we work with, but particularly asks a question about vaccine. So certainly here in the media in the UK, uh, Teresa and Poppy, there's been a lot of coverage of a potential breakthrough and, and rollout of a vaccine. And I'm sure that's the same uh, where you, you are as well. So we're being asked how, what plans we might be making or what response we have to the potential for a vaccine uh, coming through. Um, if there's anything that either of you uh, know about that at this stage or any preparations being made where you are, particularly uh, Poppy in Greece. Um, I don't know if you've got any reflections on that. Uh, I think it's a little soon for us to have an approach on this since we have to, to, to wait uh, in regards to the developments of uh, the vaccine um, and then check whether it is possible to, to provide any kind of uh, support in our beneficiaries. Uh, I think that we need some, some time and see whether vaccines are going to be available for everyone, if I understand the question correctly. Thank you. I, I think that's what's being asked there. It certainly feels the same uh, here in the UK. It's sort of unclear what will be available and when and certainly to whom uh, as well, I think. Um, certainly it will be another um, step forward in the work that we do to help the communities we work with respond to COVID, but it is so uncertain at the moment. I think that's very true. Uh, Teresa, coming back to, to you a little bit, um, you've worked across a wide variety of countries in the work that you do uh, with SOS Children's Villages. Um, incredibly diverse cultural backgrounds, community backgrounds, uh, and so on. Are there themes which you think are, are common to each of the um, programs that you've been involved with across all those countries? Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, I mainly lived in, um, in Africa and especially East, uh, West, South and North Africa, actually Africa, <laughs> developed Africa. And uh, what I have seen mainly is that, um, you know, mental health, that is my field, mental health is something that people have not really seen the importance about, you know? And mental health is being considered as a separate unit from everything else. However, if we look at 
the definition, the World Health Organization definition of mental health. It says that mental health is a state of well-being where a person fully functions and is able to fully function at the same time be of service to the community. And it is not the absence of mental illness. So when we take that definition, we remove mental illness totally out. So what I have seen in different countries is that when people hear about mental health, they immediately think about mental illness. And this has really interfered with our process of supporting people to really get to that point of fully functioning. Because whenever you come in from the perspective of mental health, they are thinking, hmm, I'm not mentally ill, you know? So what we are working on right now is that we would like to be able to help people to um, remove the stigma associated with mental health. Because when we look at what mental health really is, there is no need for stigma. There is no need for discrimination. And people have different needs. And let's face it, Alison, how many of us have not, have not experienced a state where we felt that we are not fully functional? There are times that you feel very tired, worn out, depressed. You know, there are times when you cannot control your anger. There are times when you feel that, oh my gosh, I can't get out of my bed. So all of us, yeah, we, we can identify with the need to be supported to be fully alive. And so I, I have seen that it is very important for us to be able to embed mental health into all our interventions. It is not a separate unit. It, it needs to be actually part and parcel of our functioning, everything. When we come to education, when we come to nutrition, when we come to health, when we come to uh, uh, social relationships, Everything, you name it, mental health needs to be embedded in there. So uh, what I've been working hard towards is to be able to integrate mental health and also, you know, sensitize people about, you know, the stigma associated with mental health. It needs not exist. So this is one of the things that I have seen. At the same time, what I see common in all these um, countries is that um, the caregiver, the caregiver really needs to be paid attention to. Because as I said earlier before, many times we talk about uh, the children over and over again, which is important, but we forget. We forget the caregivers. And so when I sit in round tables with the caregivers, they tell me, you know, we would like to have this, we would like to be this, we would like to be supported on this end, we would like, we would like. Uh, so I feel that this is something that um, we really need to put into consideration, that we need to invest a lot more for the caregivers so that they can in turn be able to support the children. Absolutely, thank you. Poppy, please. Well, I think that Teresa gives me the best openings ever, <laughs> uh, because we <clears throat> sorry, uh, because we saw people that were so depressed while staying in camps or in apartments that were not able even to uh, walk up from their beds and care for their children. They were that depressed that they could not continue with their application. They could do, not do even the, the simplest thing to continue with their lives. And uh, this was one of the main reasons we decided while still working in emergency mode to start planning ahead and provide more inclusive services. Um, and this is why we had to expand SOS family strengthening programs, those that were started in Greece almost a decade ago for the support of local families that were hit by recession in order to accommodate the needs of asylum seeking families. Um, this way, parents or caregivers have the chance to interact with local families, identify issues that they are not uh, issues that are uh, similar, other people are uh, dealing with 
and work on their parental and vocational skills and um, find a way to provide for their families instead of solely relying on charity and social support. They have someone to share their issues and work on them and improve not their parental skills, but the ways, the, mechani the coping mechanism for their depression, because it's difficult. It is really difficult for these people to stay sane while dealing with all these difficulties. So we need to create bonds and we need to create a safety net that will keep these people healthy, thus will keep children healthy as well. And again, that speaks so strongly to the long-term support that SOS Children's Villages specialises in uh, for children and their families, even in these emergency settings uh, when where children and families are in crisis. Uh, thank you very much. Please uh, do send in questions that you have for Poppy and Teresa. Um, we've they're very open to being um, quizzed further on anything that they have um, said to you today or any other aspects of their work. Um, in the meantime, to, to both, um, both of our panelists, um, although I'm not sure how you would answer this question, but, but what has been the most memorable day that you have had working with SOS Children's Villages? And you're only allowed to pick one day. Uh, Teresa, uh, maybe I could come to you first on that one. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I have about 365 memorable days. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to, to pick one. Uh, I was in Iraq. I remember in Iraq and I was in a um, refugee camp. We have a lot of uh, refugee camps in northern Iraq, and um, the refugee camps actually hold even up to 80,000 people. So I remember um, that I visited one of these camps with the colleagues um, in uh, Duhok, and uh, our volunteers and our colleagues in Iraq who are working with the children um, in a certain psychological intervention that we were supervising. And so um, I remember going in when one of the sessions was on and this child just puts up his hand and says, I want to share something. He, he was barely nine years old. Um, he, he said, you know, I witnessed a lot of bad things happen. You know, my father was killed in my presence and um, my mother and my, my other siblings, we, we escaped and we've had a lot, a lot of hardship up until now. But when SOS came in and they started supporting us and they started helping us to live in the now, instead of living in the past. Of course, acknowledging our past, but living in the now. I feel very happy. And whenever I go home and I see my mother a little sad, I tell her, mom, don't worry. Everything's gonna be okay. And we survived, we are alive now. You know, dad died, sorry for him, but he was not as strong as we are because he died, we survived. So. We need to go on. We need, to, we need to, to have hope and trust. And looking at the eyes of that child, I was like, oh my gosh. You know, it was so impressive. It was so moving. And that gave me a lot of hope, Alison. That really gave me a lot of hope and said, whatever we are doing, it has an impact. Well, that's fantastic. And I have significantly more limited experience working, uh, uh, meeting some of our children and families than you both do. But I have to say it's also when you see children engaging so positively with the work and, and services that we do with them. And you, you just really, it really comes home to you, the impact uh, the work that we does, the work that we do has. Uh, Poppy, what's been your most memorable day? Uh, 
Well, I don't know if I can pick one day, but if I had to pick one word, that would be resilience. And this is what characterizes all the cases we worked for. Uh, well, the days I, I don't think I will ever manage to forget is uh, uh, while I was visiting Moria. Uh, but I think that I have another story that I would like to share with you. Um, so it was um, during one of my regular visits at uh, Eleona's camp when Ali, a little guy around five then, uh, approached me in order to escort me to the exit. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, while we were walking, he was bombarding me with questions about everything. And uh, he asked me something that was totally normal in his mind. He asked me what my container looked like and whether I was sharing it with another family. Uh, I still do not remember how I managed to, to answer or to avoid his question. I could not comprehend how we have managed to persuade a super smart five-year-old that uh, people in Europe uh, were living in containers, sharing their space with others, and with no easy access to the outside of a camp. I still cannot imagine the, the, the frustration, the disappointment of this child when he comes to realize that things are different. Uh, what I still remember though is that when I went home in a particularly hot day and opened my fridge to have some cold water, I thought that simple things like having a cool drink or um, the privacy of uh, our own home uh, is not a right everyone enjoys. The right to childhood is not a right all children enjoy. And uh, if we cannot secure all rights Ali and every other child deserves, at least we can be there for them uh, to help them restore their childhood and help them build a future for themselves. That's an amazing story, Poppy. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, what do you think makes the work that you do, Poppy, in particular, in, in the circumstances in which you work, what makes it different from, from, from other organisations? What, what's the special thing, do you think, that we bring to, to those particular situations? Well... I don't want to sound arrogant, but I think that after all those years being there for them and supporting them during every step they take, I think that we, we help somehow to help, help them restore their child, their trust to humanity. Uh, they are not considering uh, the services they receive a charity. They think that we are part of their lives and we are there for them. For me, this is the, the, the greatest difference. Um, we are not counting beneficiaries. We are counting uh, quality services that will help people continue with their lives as normal as possible. Thank you. Thank you. How would you answer that question, Teresa? What do you think makes SOS Children's Villages work so special and unique? I really love what Poppy said, that we are not into numbers. We are into quality. That's, that's really, you hit the nail on the head. Um, and I see that um, SOS as an organization, being a child-focused organization, we are actually uh, experts in our area, uh, you know, and I see all the resources that are actually invested in ensuring that especially the care professionals are well equipped with uh, what they need to serve the children. 
I think that really distinguishes us from other organizations. And being the largest child care organization, I would think, in the world, you know, and really focusing on the well-being of the child. And now we are working so hard at this information sure that we sensitize everybody on the attachment theory, you know, attachment to children, attach, attachment theory uh, holistically. We are thinking of really ensuring that that becomes part of our care uh, process. And, um, you know, that is unique. I think that is unique because other organizations do different things. But um, the way we do it, I think, is special. I really, I'm not saying this because I am in SOS, but I am saying this because I'm really, really convinced that this is what exactly is happening. So I feel that um, the commitment of especially that mother who is in a remote place in Sierra Leone, you know, who dedicates 24 hours for the care of the children that she has under her. And I tell you, in Sierra Leone, the family houses are composed of 10 children. You know, one mother has 10 children in the family house. And she takes care of those children in such a fantastic way. You can't, you can't, you can't do anything, than, anything else than just be amazed what they are and what, and uh, so even in the society, in the different places where I have been, even in places like Syria, Lebanon, uh, Palestine, SOS is really, really respected by even government because of the services, because we are not affiliated to any gov governmental bodies or any political parties or anything. But, you know, even our neutrality really helps us to be able even to penetrate the most needy places in the different countries where we are working. So I think uh, SOS really does a lot, a lot of good work. And we have a lot of unsung those mothers who are dedicating all their time and their efforts taking care of children who have very, very different backgrounds. You know, one time I remember I was in Syria and I was looking at these mothers who had six, seven, eight children in their family houses. And each child came with a story, a big story behind their back. There was three, four, five years, but they had stories that we have never experienced ourselves. And you see this mother who is dedicated 24 hours a day to take care of these children with different backgrounds, with different traumas, with different needs, and still smile and celebrate. I think that's a fantastic thing. That's, that's an incredible picture that you uh, draw for us. I certainly have a very strong vision of, of what I like to call everyday heroism. And a her, 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 being a hero isn't, isn't, isn't the amazing superhero, one person by themselves achieving some incredible landing on the moon, for example. It's this everyday heroism of keeping going, of building resilience, of passing on love and security uh, to children and to young people, which, which makes for a better world for everybody. It, it's, a, it's a very, very, very motivating picture that you paint. Thank you, Teresa. I... I wondered if I could actually um, ask uh, Poppy a quick question um, about something slightly, slightly different, actually. Um, Poppy, you referenced the Maria camp mm -hmm. on Lesbos. Um, I, I have to say that I'm, I'm, I'm not wholly aware of, of what has happened there and what is happening now other than that has been a devastating impact on people who have virtually nothing and had a little bit of security and safety and that that, that appears to have, have even now been taken away from them. Can you describe to us really briefly what happened, but now, now what is happening and what SOS Children's Villages is involved in? Uh, well, Moria was um, a first reception centre uh, uh, that could not accommodate the number of people arriving in the island. 
So there was an expansion outside of the um, official facility and people were residing in uh, makeshift tents under the olive trees. Uh, that, I think, for, for, for over two years, if I remember correctly. So this September, there was a fire, a fire that uh, destroyed the olive grove and the official facility, and people had to abandon the area. They had to sleep uh, rough on the streets for uh, 10 days or so, and uh, the government managed to organize a camp in a matter of days, that currently accommodates almost 7,000 people. The thing is that when a, a camp is being created in a week, um, the situation is really bad, it's still bad, because people do not have um, access to running water or hygiene facilities. And based on, on uh, the, relevant, the most recent reports, uh, children will not have access to school uh, for the next few months at best. So the situation is really bad for these people that are forced to stay in the island. And uh, this is why we do our best for them to be transferred to the mainland as soon as possible. Uh, the islands cannot accommodate this number of people. And uh, even with the best intentions, uh, the camp will not be ready before February. Oh, that's, that's extraordinary. So SOS Children's Villages in Greece is supporting children to move to the mainland. Am I correct with that? Uh, we, we work at Lesbos Island, providing support for families that are staying in the second camp of the island, where the most vulnerable cases are being transferred. And uh, we, we also support families that are being transferred to the mainland in order not to be homeless, and by providing additional services through our family strengthening programs. Okay, thank you, thank you. We've got another question um, coming from one of our attendees today. Um, do SOS parents and carers have support locally from the government in the countries where we work? So if they need to access other services, how do we work alongside governments to do that? Teresa, sorry. Yes. Uh, yes, actually SOS ensures that um, um, it works with the social services in the country. And in fact, the children that are admitted to SOS have to go through uh, the social services, you know, through the Ministry of Social Affairs or Social Welfare or whatever it is called in the different countries. And that means that um, we respect all the rules of each country and ensure that we go by what the regulations are. And um, so, so we, we, as, I, as I said before, we are not affiliated, but we cooperate and partner with, uh, with the government and the, the different organizations in the country. Actually, um, what happens is that in some countries, um, especially like in Africa, the government doesn't really support SOS per se financially. It ensures that uh, it is, it, it, they give us permission to work in that country and to be in that country, but they do not support financially. They don't. I think um, only in Europe that we have governments uh, supporting uh, SOS sometimes in some situations, but in different other countries, we do not have direct support from the government. If anything, the government is asking SOS to support it in, mm -hmm. in some situations. I remember I was in a country where the, government, the, the officials would come to SOS and say, okay, we need this, we need that, we need that, that, the other, so you have to give us. So yeah, it depends on country by country, but in most cases, yeah, in those countries, we don't get direct support but they support us as an organization. They support our work. They attend our functions. They invite us for functions. We have round table meetings. Yeah, and so that, that is the kind, the kind of support that we receive. 
And from what I understand as well, we do a lot of work uh, to support governments to think better about services for children. So we try to build mm -hmm. their own understanding and capacity about what good, uh, good education services, good family support services are, and try and, and, and try and get them to contribute to the provision of those services, or at least be thinking in their own policies about how they could better support uh, that aspect. Uh, Poppy, is, is the situation different in Greece or it different particularly to the way the Greek government responds maybe to asylum seekers and refugees? Um, well, um, we follow all the rules and regulations, but as an exception from uh, the rest of the Euro Europe, we do not receive any uh, financial support from the government. We need to use our own uh, funds uh, to support our activities. Not only SOS, all child protection actors do not receive any support, any financial support from the government. At the same time, I totally agree with what you said, that we need to be there for them and provide um, insights in order to improve uh, child protection uh, law and uh, services. And to give you an example, uh, refugee children in Greece are not included in a unified child protection system. And this is why SOS as an organization chose to conclude the operation of the group homes for unaccompanied children and include refugee children in our regular programs in order to offer uh, more integrational opportunities and for refugee children to receive the same support uh, local children out of parental care receive. Uh, this is still, um, well, it was rather, I cannot find the word at the moment. Well, it was it was a surprise when we said with this with the ministry that we've managed to have refugee and local children together, and actually we have only good results and statistics to share with them. So they are working on some plans at the moment, and I am happy to share them with you when I have some update. That's great. Thank you. I've, I've got, uh, I have uh, one more question I would like to ask you both um, in, in the time that we have available. I mean, you, you both do incredible work. Um, I am again uh, moved by what I hear from my international colleagues and I'm thrilled and privileged to be working with you both uh, to, to give life to the, to the work that you do. But it must be really hard for you both in, in the circumstances in which you work, not to take it home with you and um, affect your own mental health and your own um, well-being. So how, how do you, and maybe I could turn to you to begin with, Teresa, how do you manage that aspect of your work? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, yes, um, sometimes you are faced with quite challenging situations and what I do is that, first of all, I believe in what Pablo Picasso said, that the meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose of life is to give it away. So I strongly feel that, you know, I have found my gift really and I want to give it away. I want to be passionate in what I do, because I would like to be able to make a difference in people's lives. And so I want to be healthy in order to be able to do that. And so what I do is that, of course, in my profession, um, I, we, need, we need ongoing learning, we need supervision. So I have a supervisor whom I see every two weeks and I invest, I invest in that and that is sacrosanctum. Nobody's gonna take that away from me because it's very, very important. At the same time, I, I do a lot of self-work, like I do uh, meditation um, a lot, you know. Uh, when the gyms were open, I used to do sport. Right now, I have to do it in my own house. And um, one, one other thing that really helped me is gratitude. 
because I have decided to really cultivate an attitude of gratitude so that every single day before I go to sleep, I recognize three things that I am grateful for. And being gr grateful, you can't be grateful and depressed at the same time. So when I am grateful, I'm not depressed. And so that gives me a lot of energy. And I like to look at the world as an opportunity to be better. Not, that, not a, a, a huge problem that I have to deal with. Absolutely not. It is an opportunity to flourish. It's an opportunity to give. Even when you don't have anything materially, you can give of yourself. So that really helps me to move on and to stay focused. Thank you. Thank you. Poppy, what about you? How, how do you stay focused and, and, and stay upbeat and positive? Well, I'm not sure if I'm always successful, but I for sure will try the practice Teresa just shared about the three things I feel grateful for before going to sleep every night. Uh, well, for me, the... Uh, well, I think that we find motivation when we see the immediate results our services have to children. And at the same time, I am, I am grateful because I'm part, I am a part of a team that works really well together. And we receive the appropriate super, supervision in order to continue with our daily routine. It takes time, it is challenging, but we need to stay strong and be there for those that are in dire need of our support. Thank you, thank you both. And uh, a comment's come in from one of our um, participants today to say how powerful and thought-provoking and inspiring uh, your words have been. So I think that you've also given everybody who's been listening in on this uh, discussion as well, um, a, a way forward in the way that they, they think about uh, their daily lives as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, we only have a, a couple, couple more minutes. Uh, Teresa, is there anything that you would like to say to our supporters in particular, anything that you feel you haven't covered this morning? Yeah, uh, first of all, I feel that uh, it's really a privilege to be able to share these experiences with, uh, with these wonderful people who actually are our heartbeat because they, they make us tick, really. And one, one, one thing I would like to say is that there's something I strongly believe in, that, you know, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change, you know? And, uh, you know, that has also really helped me in my work. And I encourage people to really change attitude towards things and be able to, uh, because when I change, my outlook, what I'm looking at will change. And the way we do anything is the way we do everything. So even in that little thing that you do, even when you give like one euro, that, that, that's, that's fantastic. And that even shows that you are generous, not only in giving that little thing, but in yourself as a person. So I really, really appreciate this opportunity. Teresa, thank you. Poppy, any final words from you? Well, I wanted to, 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 to thank you for giving me today the, the opportunity to share moments of uh, our day and how we work. I really appreciate the, this privilege um, because it gives us the chance to share our experience and to receive the positive energy we need in order to continue. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are right to time. That just leaves me uh, to say that the privilege, in fact, has been mine to have Teresa and Poppy join us this morning. Thank you so much for your time. And I know that you are both uh, very busy. And thank you for your words. Uh, which I think we have all found, uh, we've all welcomed and, and all found very inspiring. 
thank you, a final thank you to our supporters and our donors. Um, Teresa described you as the heartbeat, and I, I think you really are at the center of everything that you have heard Teresa and Poppy talk about this morning. So thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, please do feel free to contact us with any other questions you might have for us uh, or Poppy or Teresa um, uh, in the coming days. Again, thank you to everybody for taking part today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.